Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you uh, for joining us. Atif, thank you very much for, uh, for submitting to this. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank uh, you for, for doing I'm, this. I'm, I'm very excited about um, uh, the chance to talk with you about your book, uh, House of Debt. Um, for those of you who um, have not read it, um, it's available on Amazon with one click. So um, uh, everything else in in the world exactly, <laughs> um, and uh, you know what I found in in um, in thinking about it is is you know it was about a debt crisis in two thousand eight that seems a history and that seemed like everything had been written about it, um, but in fact uh, I think if you hear Atif's argument and his co-author and uh, think through um, their solution. Not only do you learn something about 2008, but I think it has a lot of application for how we think about other problems going forward. So Atif, just to begin, give us the short, brief summary of the book for those here who haven't had a chance to read it. Yes, uh, thanks, Ram. So actually, thank you for introducing the book that way, because actually it's in the subtitle as well. Because, but one of the rationale for writing this book was not as much to describe what happened, but really to look forward and say, look, there is, some, there is one very important lesson that we need to take away from the crisis of 2008, 2009, which applies looking forward. And it applies not just to the US, but also for Europe and for the global economy in general. And I'll try to kind of explain that as, as we go along. Um, the starting point of the book is really sort of the comparison of 2009 versus 2006. Uh, and this is kind of also gives you a sense of how economists like to think. So if you compare 2009, uh, let's say end of 2009 versus the end of 2006, you see that the US economy uh, is hit very hard. Uh, loss of jobs, 8.9 million people lose their jobs. That's like the entire country of Switzerland getting fired or the entire workforce of Netherlands getting fired. I mean, that's how big this loss was. In terms of output or income, um, US GDP de declined by 10 percentage points relative to what it should have been. Um, um, in 2009, uh, that's like a $1.4 trillion loss. Uh, in a different way, it's a loss equivalent uh, to $12,000 per household in the US. And that's a loss they're bearing every year relative to the counterfactual world of no recession taking place. So the natural question, or obvious next question, is why did this happen? Why did it take place? Now, from one perspective, and that is kind of the way economists like to think, from one perspective, it's actually a big puzzle because nothing really happened between 2006 and 2009. We had this huge loss, but nothing really happened. What do I mean by that? Think of what it takes to produce stuff in an economy, apples, oranges, iPhones, automobiles, so on. The two main ingredients, human beings, their skills, their human capital, and the physical capital that marries that human capital and produces the goods and services that all of us then, then use. In terms of those ingredients, nothing changed. People had the same skills, we had the same factories, the same cities, the same infrastructure, and yet we could not produce as much in 2009 as we were producing in 2006. So something kind of uh, uh, strange happened. And what is, it, uh, what, is, what, what is it really that's responsible for that big decline in output? The core argument in the book is, and we give it away in the title, that it's all about debt. That the, cause of this precipitous fall in output and employment um, is the way we choose, and that's an important word, it's a choice, the way we choose to write financial contracts among ourselves. In particular, between the borrower and the lender, it's the predominant contract is debt, and that choice was actually responsible for the decline in output and employment. Now, once you hear me say it was a choice, the next natural conclusion is what Tom started off with, which is because it is a choice, we can change it. And we can avoid falling, falling into a similar trap the next time. Um, and not just us in the US, but also Europe, also Japan. It's actually a global problem. Um, OK, so I have so far just asserted that debt was responsible for this big decline in output and employment. Um, both Hamid and I, my co-author, we are uh, empiricists at heart. And so anyone makes a statement, we don't believe it. We say, OK, where is the evidence? Where is the proof? So that's one of the distinguishes, is distinguishing features of our work, if I can uh, kind of uh, tout my own horn, um, is that we use data. It's everything, you know, we, 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 we get micro level data from the US to paint a picture that proves that debt was actually responsible for this big decline in output and, and employment. 
So what's the what's the argument based on this on, on this evidence? The key factor, uh, the, the key characteristic of debt, which makes it so destructive at times for the macro economy, is the inability of a debt contract to share risk between the borrower and the lender. And in particular, when I say share risk, this is really the downside risk that we are talking about. So just take a standard uh, debt contract. Say I want to buy a house, $100,000 uh, is the value of the house. I only have $20,000. I go to Tom, say, give me a loan of $80,000. He gives me a loan. It's a standard 30-year fixed rate mortgage. <coughs> I buy the house, and now I start living in the house. Now imagine that for some reason, you know the animal spirit sentiments go up <laughs> and down. Imagine that for some reason the value of my house falls by $20,000, okay? What happens in this relationship between Tom and myself in this example? Tom is the creditor, I am the borrower. What happens in this relationship is that the entire loss of, in the house is $20,000, 20% is borne by me. My equity is wiped out. If I'm a typical homeowner in the US, it basically means the home, home is also pretty much my entire asset base. So my net wealth, I'm basically wiped out. What has happened to Tom in this example? Actually, he has lost nothing. Because the value of his mortgage was 80,000 to begin with, the value of my house is still 80,000. So if I don't pay, he can grab my house, sell it, take his 80,000, put, put the 80,000 in, in his pocket. And so he actually, in this example, has not lost anything. I have borne the entire loss. Now, there's nothing immoral about this, by the way. Don't get me wrong. If we, we knew what we were getting into. We, I, I voluntarily borrowed from. So there's, this, it's not about ethics. It's about economics. The problem really is, if it were just me, that's the end of it, and you know who cares? The problem really is that when the shock is systemic, when the shock is at the macro level, it's not just me we are talking about. It's millions of people like me who, whose net worth has been wiped out, and that loss has not been shared by people like Tom in this example who are going to be the creditors. Now, you can already see that there is this tension here from a social perspective. Because by definition, the borrowers are borrowers because they don't have the money. So they are, tend to be poorer, less well off in the economy. The lenders are going to be, you know, have the excess savings, and so they're lending, the so, so they're going to be richer. So what we are really talking about is that we have chosen, again, to have a financial system that imposes, tends to impose losses on the borrower side that actually has the least capacity to bear those losses, to absorb those losses. And that's the fundamental problem. That lack of risk sharing is the fundamental problem. So let me now take a move a step forward and, and, and sort of explain how that lack of risk sharing actually translates into what I started off with, which is the loss of jobs, the loss of output. The key problem with the lack of risk sharing is that because people, the borrowers, which is myself in this example, um, they tend to be poorer. They also tend to be very sensitive to these shocks to their income and wealth. And so when I have this huge shock to my net wealth, what am I going to do? I'm going to get really scared. Uh, I've lost my savings. My children's education is potentially in, in, in question. What will I try to do? I'll try to start saving again as much as possible. And the flip side of that is I'll, I'll stop spending to the extent possible. So you're, and if there are millions of people like me, that's going to be a huge cutback in, on, on, on spending, on aggregate demand in the economy. Now imagine for a second a counterfactual where we somehow had devised a financial system that had shared this risk differently, okay? Which we knew upfront. So I'm not talking about bailouts or anything like that. Like upfront, people knew that in the event of a downturn, it would have been shared differently. And imagine for the sake of argument that instead of imposing the losses on me, we shared the risk so that people like Bill Gates absorbed most of this risk. You know? The point is that if they had to absorb this risk, they already have a lot. So it's not like they're not going to buy that extra car because you know, they have two million instead of three million in the bank. Um, and the economy as a result would suffer less. So that's the first key argument. And if you really look at the logic of this argument, I'm talking about a macro externality here, which, which, which is a, a kind of like secondhand smoke argument, right? That other people are suffering as a result of the actions that Tom and I uh, decide to, to take, which is borrow and lend to each other, right? Um, and, and, and so the spending decline is much worse in the presence of a highly levered economy, which, ha which, which has a lot of debt or borrowing on, uh, on, on, on behalf of uh, households. Uh, that's the first step. 
The next step is that once I cut back on spending, and remember other people like me are also cutting back on spending, um, the stuff that we used to buy, other people are producing it. Um, they may not have borrowed at all, right? That secondhand smoke effect. They may not have borrowed at all, but because now I'm not buying as much stuff, they get fired as well. And now that they get fired, they also stop spending. So you, you have this knock-on effect start to reverberate in the economy, and the process and the, 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 the depression becomes deeper, the recession becomes deeper. There is a second important effect, which is that when I can't, when my net wealth is wiped out, it's also likely, in many cases, that I'll stop paying my uh, uh, mortgage, which means now the asset is taken away from me and is thrown into foreclosure. Because millions of people are actually going into foreclosure, that actually worsens the fall in house prices. And again, further amplifies the, the, the kind of effects that I'm talking about. So this very quickly, in the case of the US, and you know, specific with the housing example, is the key problem with debt, which is its lack of risk sharing uh, on the downside. So uh, that's a, a great summary. But there's several things that flow from that. One is, um, I mean, it wasn't all the bankers? Uh, because really, in fact, if you read the President's State of the Union last night, he, 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 he could barely spit out the word bankers. I mean, it was like he, you know, I, I know, I know, I know we know don't like bankers in this country, but, you know, so what you're saying, a couple things jump out at me. One is that a lot of people are responsible for taking on debt they shouldn't have taken on. That said, um, it seems to me one of the problems of this crisis, by the way, is a real parallel, I think, with uh, the climate <coughs> crisis, is that we massively underpriced the risk. We allowed people who did it to privatize the gains, and then we socialized the losses over the whole economy. We do the exact same thing in, in, in nature. So talk um, about what is that the role of the consumer in this, but then your idea, if the problem was that we focused all the risk onto one party, how do we basically spread out the risk um, in a way that actually cushions the fall and puts us with a much better trampoline yes. to go forward in the future? Yes. There's a lot of stuff in, yes. your, in, 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 your, in your I got a million questions I'll, I'll, for you, and I'll, I'll, we only got 20 more minutes. I'll, I don't want to miss anything. I'll, 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 I'll yeah. try to touch upon some others. First of all, regarding the banks, right? So we already, there's a subtitle uh, of, the, of the book which says how they and you <laughs> cause the financial yes. crisis, right? So we deliberately put in you. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, some, of the, some people were saying, look, you should not say you because they're your buyer. You, you yeah, know, they're, they're going to buy the book. Why, why do you want to blame them? But we <laughs> deliberately put the you in there to make the point that this is really about the system as a whole. You know, this finger pointing that this is the banker's problem or this is the borrower's problem. In the example I gave between Tom and I, nobody forced us. We are both mm -hmm. mature adults voluntarily entering into this arrangement. And so the point is that, look, it's not about, although excesses were done, and don't, I don't want to belittle that point, but that's not the core problem. The core problem is that the system is not built properly. And I want to push more on that in, 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 um, in, uh, in, 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 in a bit. Uh, let me address the other uh, uh, part of your question, which is looking forward, how do we build something alternative? How do we build something that has better capacity to absorb uh, the downside uh, risks? Um, fundamentally, what that means is that we want to move away from a world where debt is the predominant contract. Now, what do I really mean by debt? We need to define it a little bit more. What I really mean by debt is a contract which is non-contingent. There is no contingency in the contract in terms of what else is happening in the world. That's really kind of a silly way to write a financial contract given the problem that I just talked about. So what we want to move towards is we want to move towards a world where the financial contracts allow for these kinds of important contingencies in the macro environment in particular. Um, in the book, we have one specific example because mortgage is one huge asset class uh, in the world. And so we give one specific example of how we can do this in the space of mortgages. The specific example is, and we try to minimize the deviation from what exists in the world right now uh, so that it, it, it is more feasible than it otherwise would have been. And so the proposal that we have, and it really is the philosophy that's important, so you can, you, you can tweak the details, that's not that important. Um, but the, the precise pr proposal we have is the following. It has two features. So the first is you want to introduce that contingency into the standard 30-year uh, mortgage. Uh, and that contingency is that we link the required payments that the borrower has to uh, make. We link those payments to what is happening to the 
price of houses in my city. And so you index the repayment to the house price index of the city that you live in, number one. So if average house costs in Minnesota or Minneapolis are going down by 10%, my mortgage will go down by 10%. 10%. Exactly. So, so I'm much more resilient then against what's happening in the market. Exactly. So if you were making $1,000 a month, now you will make $900 a month, right? So there is this automatic absorption of loss uh, uh, for the... Uh, from the borrower, it goes, loss goes to the creditor. Um, if that's, that's the first important uh, feature. If that's all you add to this contract, the lender, of course, will know that up front, and they know that now I'm taking in less in the event of a, of a downturn. So they want to jack up the price of the loan, the interest rate of the loan. Um, so we want to write, introduce this product in a way that is it's neutral up front. And so we introduce a second component, which gives something to the lender in return for providing this insurance. And what we propose is, so we work out the numbers, a little bit of math here, which you can work out. It's quite simple. Uh, but once you work out the math, it turns out that I have to give very little to Tom uh, on the upside to make him uh, a whole in terms of the insurance that he's providing me. And the idea is that basically home house prices don't go down as, you know, that frequently. So it's not, he's not really giving up much. But it's really important in the sense that we can avoid 2008 uh, kind of crises. And so the upside that I want to give Tom is just five percentage points. So just five cents out of every dollar of capital gains that I have at the, at the time of sale of the house, not house, otherwise. House makes a $100,000 profit for me. The bank gets $5,000. The that. bank gets $5,000. Is it's insurance premium on having insured the downside. Exactly. But you know what's interesting about your proposal is that you're really saying, let's take the experience of a mortgage, which is really, I'm going to put it in terms of nature, a monoculture. It's a single fix thing. And let's turn it into a polyculture ecosystem that is so much more resilient to whatever nature, whatever storms come, or whether the sun shines more. You are my next co-author, so the next book I'm writing with you. Yeah. So, you, know, you have these wonderful analogies. Do you think I have a future in journalism? Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it's but that's really, it's, it's, it's really very interesting. There's a real parallel with, with yes, the, yes. You know. I, th I think, and I, again, to, to continue your nature example, yeah. I mean, it, it's really, I always like to think of the, the macroeconomic system as, a, as an ecosystem. And I think all of us lose if we don't think of uh, the macro environment as, a, as an ecosystem. Uh, for every buyer, uh, there is a seller, or for every seller, there has to be a buyer. So, you know, the supply and demand things need to equate each other in the aggregate. And we currently have a system where we, we kind of pretend that the contract may not be efficient, but whenever the crisis comes, it's house prices or the euro crisis or whatever, that somebody from the outside will come and fix it for us. And we have technical names for that. We call it monetary policy. We call it fiscal policy, right? That when the shock is big enough, you know what? We can, and today we saw a big bazooka, right? The Draghi uh, doing a big, big quantity easing. And, 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 and the idea, uh, and people still believe that, you know, there are monetarists who will say, look, this, is, this stuff works. Just do enough of it. You know, you, you just never did enough uh, of quantitative easing. Or on the fiscal side, you know, just, just have enough government spending and you can get out of this problem. Now, theoretically, I agree those arguments make sense on the margin. But I don't think... And certainly the proof suggests that they are not sufficient. They weren't sufficient in the US. They were not uh, sufficient in the, in, in, in the case of Japan and, and, and Europe. So we really need to go back to the financial system as it is supposed to work without any outside intervention and try to make it as resilient to these outside shocks as possible. Uh, and what I think is the beauty of your proposal, it's, and this is another way of describing resiliency, it's self-sustaining. As you said, you know, one approach is to say we wait for Draghi to do the right thing. We hope, we, we hope he gets the numbers right, or whether Draghi or you know, our, our Fed. Um, but that's all external. Um, uh, and, and we hope that, that all these external rules and, and rule makers will do the right thing. Your system is what to me are the two most important words in economics and foreign policy. It's self-sustaining. It's all about internal logic and behavior. That's, 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 that's exactly uh, right. I mean, the other problem in terms of betting on an outside player is that you get into the politics uh, right. a, a, lo a lot more often. Which is a different kind of contingency, which is exactly. un unmoored to economics. Exactly, know, so. right, exactly. I mean, you know, it, there is a, I know there is a theoretical argument uh, that exists out there that says that if we had a fully functioning political system, then we can solve all, it's actually a theorem. Uh, <laughs> we, can, we can solve all of these problems, right? Uh, if we had, you know, you can put it in the words of the Coase theorem and things like that. 
it's and that's true. So you know, the, the, so mathematically, it is true that you know that we can we can work around this problem in other ways. But practically, uh, you know, just think of the, the the polarization in the U.S. But it's really there in every place. Uh, these things become impractical from uh, from a realistic. Uh, perspective. What are the chances of uh, banks? Uh, has anyone taken you up? Um, is anyone adopting this? Is anyone studying it? What are the chances we we get buy-in on this? Very important question. So I have uh, a, a few observations on that. Uh, First of all, actually, it's in the book as well. The, the first time I actually proposed that, it, this was in a Senate hearing. Hmm. And the senator in question, it was Senator Corker, I've already public, uh, we, mm -hmm. it's in the, in the book. He said to me after I make this proposal, and I say, okay, now he'll say, you know, yeah, it's really, we, let's go ahead and do it. Um, he says to me, this is the oddest proposal I've ever heard in my life. So, you know, that was kind of uh, 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 deflated us a little bit. Uh, but yeah. we continued, we persisted, we wrote the book nonetheless. Um, I think there ha so we, I went again actually to a second time to the Senate uh, to, to give testimony in the Senate, and the second time actually they were more amenable to these kind of ideas, both on the right and on the left. Um, so th there is some recognition that we need to do things differently, but it's not it's 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 not a done deal by any stretch of imagination. What is interesting in terms of response uh, is that there. I have gotten calls from venture capitalists, to give you an example, where they have come in and said, look, we really like this idea, and we are actually willing to put in a lot of money behind it. Mm. In fact, they, they say you are too conservative in your proposal. They are willing to do full equity mortgages. Um, and the reason they give, is kind of makes sense, is that, look, we have long-term capital from pension funds and so on. They want exposure to house price risk. And effectively, what mm. I'm saying is I'm giving creditors a direct yes. exposure to house price risk. They, they said to me, look, we don't want to kind of buy rental properties and get exposed that way, it's management and all that. Go, doing it through the homeowner is like a very cheap way of doing it because, you, you know, they will take care of the house themselves. Um, so there is, uh, there is a lot of private sector interest uh, in it as well. But why does it, does it not happen? I think that is a very important question. Um, I think it does not happen uh, because of our own fault. So let me try to specify. The first of all, if you go back to the logic of the argument that I made in the beginning in terms of the problems the m associated with debt. Uh, I use the term macro externalities, right? It's kind of second, second hand smoke kind of a thing. Um, when we macro talk externalities. externalities. When we talk about externalities, that's like another example would be we mandate insurance for a reason. Because if I'm driving on the road and I don't have insurance, I may not care about it, but you know, if I hit Tom and he is injured or his car gets destroyed, I better have the capacity to compensate him for, for the loss that he has borne. So you mandate the insurance. Or it's the same logic, again, because there are these macro externalities. So first, the gov there is a logical argument for the government to be involved in this process in terms of facilitating mm -hmm. us moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. That's point number one. Point number two is the realization that we live in a world where the situation is actually much worse. Not only is the government not helping, or encouraging the system to move in the right direction, it is actually putting big obstacles in the way of moving away from debt. Hmm. And I'll give you two specific examples. The first one is just taxation. And as soon as I say that, I, you know what I'm talking about. In the US, there is a, a deductibility uh, of interest when you file your taxes, both on the corporate side as well as on the household side. Uh, that is incentivizing me as a borrower, you know, suppose I have two options, I have the 30 year fixed rate mortgage and the proposal that we make. I will not take on the mortgage, even though it is good for me or, and the economy, because the standard mortgage allows me to deduct the interest payments um, um, of, uh, at the time I file my taxes. So that tilts the system in favor of debt. Um, another factor, again, coming from the regulatory side, is the way we do bank capitalization. So if you go to the basics of the Basel system that we have, which puts risk weights in terms of telling banks how much capital they need to have on their balance sheet for the loans that they issue, for the assets that they have on the balance sheet, um, it is tilted in a way that if I'm a bank, and I want to think, I'm deciding, should I issue a standard mortgage or should I issue this, what we call the shared responsibility mortgage with this loss absorption feature? When the bank is contemplating that question, the Basel rules tell them, look, if you issue a standard mortgage, you don't have to have much capital against it because it's considered AAA, very safe. You mm -hmm. don't have to have much capital against it. But if you choose to issue this loss absorbing thing, 
Guess what? Mm -hmm. The capital requirements are going to be much higher. Yeah, interesting. Very so interesting. what is the bank going to do? Yeah. I mean, it is not a coincidence that we live in an extremely levered world. And this is a really dangerous trend coming now at the, at, at, at the global level. This is by, by no means just about the U.S. If you look at the growth of credit or, you know, two sides of the same coin, whether we talk about credit or debt, the growth in debt or credit globally has been going up since the 80s. There was, you know, since this deregulation and you know, loosening of controls, capital controls and so on, since the 80s, credit to GDP ratio has been continuously going up. So much so that even this crisis, you know, we hear these terms, deleveraging and so on. At the global level, there has been no deleveraging. We have levered up even more since 2008, 2009. To give you one quick example of that, it is true that the homeowners reduced the amount of debt that they have in the US, but China started borrowing like crazy, both their homeowners as well as uh, their local governments and so on. There is something wrong. This is beyond the books, so I don't want to go there too much, but there's, some, there's something fundamentally wrong about how the system is trying to equilibrate itself. It's, it's a, the self-sustaining piece is, is there's something well, wrong I mean, the, in that. The, the beauty, and, and it's related to your point, um, again, there's an analogy from nature, but your system prevents contagion. There's, or there's much less contagion possibility um, when you have this kind of internally driven system. It's much more resilient to contagion. It's much more resilient to disease than one that where everybody's basically playing the same game and, and then our banks are interconnected. And so when my banks topple from my mortgages, we help topple your banks. Um, and we, we really saw that. Uh, you know, we, we have such a short, I wanna make sure we get a few questions uh, from the floor. So uh, anyone, uh, please, uh, 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 Bill. shared services and assets in cities so that, you know, for example, your car is idle 23 hours a, a day. Let, let's use that much more efficiently, optimize resources. Now we are talking about shared responsibilities. What does that mean for theory? What does that mean for policy making? And how close are you to Islamic financing in this <laughs> Let me answer the second question first. Uh, which is that I stay away from all such questions. Um, <laughs> it was a good question. The, the, the reason is that I, I strictly believe in the separation of religion and state, and I also believe, <laughs> I, 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 and I also strictly believe in the separation of religion and science. And so I, I like to be a social scientist. So I stay, stay away yeah. from those conversations. Um, in terms of the shared economy and all, all that kind of things, I, I think the really interesting piece here for us to think about, and my example is just a little tiny piece of it, is that the technological innovations, especially on the information side. Because you know, finance is really about information, right? Information gathering and, and, and making sure people are doing what they're supposed to do, monitoring information and so on. The technology is now really allowing us to do that much more efficiently than we ever could. And as a result of that, it is giving us the capacity to do things like risk sharing of the kind that I was talking about. To give you one specific example, you mentioned time sharing on maybe car rentals and things like that. Um, in the proposal that I have, remember I was giving a five percentage upside to, 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 to Tom. Tom does not have to wait for me to sell my house to exercise that five percent. He can, guess what, securitize it, yes, interesting, yeah, and yeah, sell it. You yeah. know, that's a beautiful system. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with securitization. Actually, it, the system works even better. So technology is we should adopt mm -hmm. it, we should embrace it, but we should think about the fundamentals of what we need to do with the technology to make it work for us. Please. We'll get to everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, I just, it's a bit of a, uh, sorry, a bit of a technical point. Uh, Where are you from? Uh, South Africa. Okay. So, uh, uh, banks finance their books, their mortgage books, with depositors' money. So if the property price drops by 10%, how do you adjust the depositors? Yes. Mm, right. Good question. I mean, who's going to accept that? Absolutely. Uh, very good question. And the, the answer is the second piece of it, which I did, never talked about, but is obvious. Uh, the banks as they exist, we can't have them. Um, banks need to have more capital, much more equity, much more capacity to absorb some of these losses themselves. And I really don't understand why we cannot, th so let me give you this idea. Think of where the big development on the economic side has been, new technology, right? Microsoft, Apple, new tech, and so on. Did they need banks to do what they did? It is all equity financed. And they can raise more if they want to buy more stuff. I would give them money. 
Why are we willing to give as much money to Elon Musk as, as, as he wants? The reason is that he has developed this credibility, this reputation that I'm smart, I know what works, I know what doesn't work, and people are willing to. This is the kind of banks that we want. You know, if they have more equity, they will be forced to act like Elon, more like Elon Musk and, and less like what we know uh, them to do. So there is, again, there is something fundamental. I know I'm making, you know, when you really think through that, what we are, we are talking about a reformation of the financial system of the, archi the financial architecture as we, as we have it. And the argument is that you know, it, it, it needs to work for us, not, not the other way around. Because you do adjust deposit. I mean, we, anyone who's got their money in the bank knows well. I'm not getting the return I used to get. It's adjusted according to interest rate. That's right, not, yeah. Not, not according to market. Can, yeah, yeah. Behind you was a question. Oh, yes. Um, Peter Holmesicourt. One of the reasons for your proposal is that come a shock dropping of housing prices, for example, um, there'd be less impact on the economy. Isn't your proposal just spreading the risk such that the other side, the bankers, will be down as well? There'll be less bonuses, there'll be less BMWs bought, there'll be less wealth spread around at that end of the society. The net drop of the society will be the same. Um, that's kind of related to this earlier question of, uh, you know, how do, how do we deal with these, the banks being able to absorb more losses? Um, but, you know, banks are just an abstraction. They are just an intermediary between the savers and the, and, and, and the borrowers. And at the end of the day, somebody has to absorb those losses. That's another way of thinking about it. If house prices go down by a trillion dollars, well, somebody has to, you know, there is no way around it. They, you can't send it to Mars. The question is, who has the highest capacity to absorb it? So this is where the research comes in. When you actually measure the marginal propensity to consume with respect to these wealth shocks and income shocks, it turns out that the people getting those million dollar bonuses, they have close to zero marginal propensity to consume with respect to these shocks, which means, at least on the margin, if you take away a dollar from them, they're still going to buy the BMW. Um, so you really want to take the losses away from the people who are the most sensitive to these kind of shocks and share the risk that way, which is you know, the premise of uh, of the proposal that we are making. Atifa, this is really fascinating, and I could talk to you um, all afternoon about this. Unfortunately, we have to share this room, and um, uh, so we're going to have to bring it to a close, but thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank it's you really much. wonderful. Thank really you. appreciate it.